This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Eva International Media Limited. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virch, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. Today, I'm super excited to have Mark Mills on the podcast. Um, Mark is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a free market think tank, and he's also the author of The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom in a Roaring 2020s. So Mark, thanks for joining the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm I am uh, I am pumped, as I say. Let's let's uh, <laughs> let's talk. In fact, your chotchkeys are better than my chotchkeys. I was going to put this chotchke in the background. I forgot. <laughs> I mean, ah, yeah. I used I had an Estes model rocket that looked almost exactly like that when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, the Estes built their model rockets look like the Tantan rocket in yeah. uh, Destination Moon, and uh, huh. you know that that that, that was uh, for kid for kids of a certain age before the Apollo program, before the Gemini program. Yeah. I mean, decades before that, you know, you had uh, Hergé doing the, uh, the, the, uh, the space, uh, uh, space comic, so to speak, that yeah. was bizarrely accurate. I mean, you yeah. think when he did it in 1930s, he right. had them in spacesuits that looked correct. Mm-hmm. He had the dust on the moon. He had the landscape pretty good. I mean, it was really quite from 1930s. Anyway, I digress. It's- but, yeah, but that, that was fun, man. I love building those small rockets. Well, today we're going to talk about something similar to that. I, I really want to talk about energy. And okay. as we as we were talking before, um, this energy transition, which I'm working, by the way, part-time, I'm working with a company to help them grow their energy transition businesses, things like carbon capture and geothermal and wind and solar, all these different things. But there, I have basically one thesis when it comes to energy that I think is the overarching super important. Everybody is missing it and not talking about it. And that's how we're going from the frying pan into the fire in terms of in the 20th century, we were dependent on oil and gas. And this Ukraine mess is, you know, the world is beholden to Russia's oil and gas, especially Europe, to now we're moving into electrification and wind and solar. And it's all, not all, but most of that is built in China. And the we're about to be beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. And so I really want to talk about that. And you're kind of probably one of the world's experts in that area. Um, so there's my thesis. What do you, I see you nodding. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, your thesis is, is, is absolutely correct. Uh, and it's, ha- it's, if I were going to put in simple terms, the, the problem with the transition <clears throat> is not that we don't, with the idea of a transition away from hydrocarbons Mm -hmm. is that what runs, first of all, counter to what's been going on through all of human history. There's never been a transition away from any energy source. We still use everything. We burn wood. There's more wood, more energy from burning wood globally than, than from solar electricity globally by a factor of two to this day. Wow. We still, we still burn coal. We still use food to make fuel. It's called ethanol. We still, use running water we still use we still use we st- the only thing we don't use are very many animals or slave labor through most of history with human human muscle power well that's not true actually to, we other countries still use what amounts to slave labor and dentured yeah. servitude of children to mine cobalt but by and large the world doesn't do that so the, the first thing i just to sort of calibrate my bias is that energy is fundamental. Nobody knows us more than someone like you. Mm-hmm. It takes a whole lot of energy to get uh, stuff in outer space. It, uh, in power terms, it's roughly, you know, the shuttle was roughly a, a nuclear power plant. So gigawatt of power, mm-hmm. roughly, as you, as you know. I apologize. Sorry. It, that's all right. Turn the phone off here. We got phones uh, and dogs. That's okay. The, you know, the dog, <laughs> we'll see how long she goes. It's usually pretty good. So you know, we use a lot, we use hydrocarbons to get rockets into space because mm-hmm. hydrocarbons are very energy dense and we haven't come up with a better means for doing that. Um, I, not true. The shuttle's engines, the, the main engines, let me see on, if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those right there, uh, the three yeah. in the back. They were, it was hydrogen. It was hydrogen and yeah, oxygen. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. true. But, but let me not be a, a, a pedant 
Uh, <laughs> you don't harvest hydrogen. The hydrogen right. is acquired by reforming natural gas. Right. So the shuttle flew on natural gas, which the carbon was stripped from it. It's the only place you get hydrogen in any quantity, any significance you can afford. That'll change, it, hopefully. We, we could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Not for a long time, not without yeah. some magic catalyst. But the as it stands now, you flew on hydrocarbons because not only did you have to use hydrocarbons, burning natural gas and oil to make the chillers and the, and the reformers and strippers to, to use the very energy intense process of getting yourself liquid hydrogen, mm -hmm. it uses hydrocarbons and it's based on hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. So that's the, you know, if you use methanol, which is which Elon Musk is doing, that's also derived from hydrocarbons. And kerosene obviously is a hydrocarbon, which is another common rocket fuel. But right. You, all of them, the only thing that has a little more energy density than, than kerosene, of course, that's why they use it in the shuttle, is liquid hydrogen. But right. it, it, it's uh, overhead cost is because of the cooling and the, the, re, the refuel challenges is why Elon Musk did the workaround, as did Bezo, Bezos. But look, energy is fundamental. So that's, you have nothing exists in the universe. You can't make or do anything without energy. So it mm -hmm. matters a lot. So what's happened over all of history is that we found new ways and better ways to produce uh, power for different things and, and, and energize things differently. So we've gone from wood to coal, coal to oil, oil to gas, nuclear power, we've got lots, but the, the list of things is rather limited. It's, 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 you can put them all on the fingers of two hands. There's no new physics in energy since the discovery of nuclear fission. And we haven't, and which, which postdates the discovery of photoelectric effect for which Einstein got the Nobel prize in 1905. Hmm. So the first photoelectric cells are older than the first nuclear reactors. And the fact that they're both almost a century old tells you how difficult it is <laughs> to make new forms of energy to add to, not transition away from what we're already using. So the transition language is a problem <clears throat> which we can talk about because it's never <clears throat> ever happened in all of human history and it's not gonna happen now. Hmm. But to your, to your point though, about <clears throat> the fact that we've got a lot of new things going on, absolutely, they mean, Battery technology, not an energy source, but a storage mechanism, is, is vastly better than any time in human history. It's the only the second revolution in batteries in all of mankind's history. Uh, there, there just haven't been haven't been many since the uh, lead acid battery. We got the nickel cadmium batteries, which were fifty percent better than lead acid batteries, and then we got lithium, courtesy of Exxon's researchers, which are four times better than lead acid in terms of energy density. Uh, so th these are these are big deals, and they'll make a big difference in terms of fueling a growing world. But I, you know, the, the problem we have, back to your point of dependencies, is that the favored energy sources <clears throat> that we're talking about, wind, solar, and batteries. And to be clear, no, the the, the pathway to the, the quote transition is hyper focused on wind, solar, and batteries. It's not on nuclear, which we we should talk about. It's not really about biodiesel. All that's in the mix, but the forecasts that the transition advocates have, have about two thirds of all energy for the next 20 years in their, in their aspirational forecasts, coming from wind, solar, mediated by batteries. That's the focus. Those energy sources reverse history's long run trend to reducing the material requirements to deliver an energy service. Or, or put in simple terms, the pounds of stuff you have to dig out of the earth mm -hmm. to deliver a road mile, an air mile, heat a ton of food, heat a ton of silicon to make, to make um, computer chips. So the progress for all of history has been to reduce the input materials quantities in, to get the same unit of energy service out. The wind solar battery path is a complete reversal of that trend. And it's not just a modest reversal. Broad brush, about a thousand percent greater increase in materials are required to, to deliver the same unit of energy if you go wind, solar, batteries versus hydrocarbons. So that's problem one. Problem two, to your point, is dependencies. The geopolitical concentration of, of capacities to deliver the key components and the key minerals refined into a chemical you can use, mm -hmm. lithiated chemicals, not lithium out of the ground. China has a larger dominance by a factor of two in energy minerals 
than, than the Middle East has for all of the hydrocarbons. So I'll restate that. Wow. The Middle East has about a third of the world's capacity to deliver oil and gas. They're about a third share. China has about a 50 to 60% share of the delivery of the world's critical energy mineral materials. It has a 90% share of polysilicon, photovoltaic cells, an 80% share of, of solar modules, about half of all the key components inside of wind turbines. We can go down the list here. It's, they have utter dominance, was deliberate strategy. So- Is that Belt and you, Road? Is, did Belt and Road help them get that? Uh, so Belt and Road helps them get access to the copper, the cobalt, right. the, the nickel. What they've done is they built the refineries in China. Mm. So Belt and Road is related uh, in terms right. of the supply chain going upstream to get the minerals. So while they observed America being antithetical, hostile towards expanding new mines, for example, rare earths are the one people talk about. We, the United States used to produce and ship to the world with 80% of all the rare earth minerals, which are essential in a lot of products. <clears throat> and they're not rare, by the way. It's called rare earths because they exhibit rare properties that are extremely valuable. Right. We have lots of rare earth minerals. We produce not zero, but nearly zero. China produces the vast majority. And more importantly, they do more than three quarters of the world's refining for the key rare earth minerals. The refining process is the equivalent of turning, you know, uh, I guess you could say iron ore in the ground into, into steel is a mm -hmm. big energy intensive process. Right. Turning oil into gasoline is an energy intensive process, but less so. So they do the refining. So that dependency is very high. And then we'll add the third, the third problem. So we have problem one, a reversal of history's requirement mm -hmm. for materials. Problem two is a reversal of the recent history's reduction of dependencies for the United States. We're not only self-sufficient in hydrocarbons, but we export, as you know. And number three is a reversal of the world's, um, I'll call it sensibilities to environmental problems. Mining is very difficult. I worked for a mining company in my youth mm -hmm. in Canada, being dual citizen now. <clears throat> Is a uranium mining company, also a uranium refiner, the only one in North America. The, uh, it, it's very difficult to do mining in a, in, a, in a fashion that we all find acceptable. And, right. and, and modern miners can do that. Yeah. It's not, they can in America and Canada, Australia. Nothing's perfect, but they're very good at it. Do you know Kinross? Yeah. I went to a Kinross mine in Russia. A, a friend of mine runs it, a colleague from Harvard Business School. It was incredible how good they were. I mean, that was a well run. They sure, never sure. have injuries. It's clean. It, it, yeah. They really did a good sure, job. Sure. Yeah, we can do so. that, but they don't do that everywhere. They don't do that anywhere right. in South America. They right. don't do that in, in a lot of Russia. In yeah. fact, the second biggest oil spill in modern history in the Arctic. Number one was the Exxon Valdez, famously some years ago. Right. Remember, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, yeah, it spilled a lot of oil in the quote, fragile ecosystem. The reason the ecosystem is fragile is it takes a long time for the oil to evaporate when it's in cold right. water. In the south, it, southern waters, microbes, natural microbes eat, eat it. Between evaporation, right. Right. microbes like to eat it, they just eat it. And, right. and we can sprinkle it with better, more microbes. Than they, so the Norilsk mine, nickel mine in Siberia, last year had an oil spill, almost as big as the Exxon Valdez oil spill mm -hmm. from the big oil tanks that they use to run all the heavy machinery. Now you could say the Russians, really aren't as well regulated on average as an American or Australian or Canadian mine. That's probably a fair criticism. Uh, and no one really cares about that oil spill because right. it wasn't Exxon. It was a Russian nickel mining company. In Siberia where there's, you know, there's not a big uh, tourism. Uh... <laughs> I didn't see any reporters flying in there to take pictures of birds that were covered right. in oil. Yeah. I, I read some stuff online, but it was very yeah. hidden. Yeah. So this, this is, this is the, and the, the other problem we have is that the minerals that are being chased for the so-called green energy transition are not just unusual ones that people up until recently haven't heard of, you know, lithium, not lithium for depression, but, you know, <laughs> lithium carbonate. In, right. So lithium and, you know, neodymium and proscenium and all the things that are not in common discourse, but you also need lots of aluminum, lots of nickel, and lots of copper, for example. These are three of the most commonly mined minerals on the planet. The green energy goals would move the energy sector from being a minor consumer of the world's three big minerals 
to being the primary consumer of those. Put differently, if you're an economist, and I play one on TV occasionally, <laughs> but this is obvious economics 101, that magnitude of demand and pressure, again, we're talking about increasing overall demand for copper, aluminum, nickel by not 10% or 20%, by hundreds to thousands of percents. Astonishing increases are yeah. inflationary. The mines can't possibly keep up to that. And so mm -hmm. what that does is it inflates copper for your homes, already happened, appliances, things we make, everything that's made from those materials will get inflated. And that inflation, uh, unsurprisingly, has already started. And the principal culprit is not Putin invading Ukraine. The principal culprit are the Western nations putting in place mandates and subsidies to convince companies to manufacture lots of stuff, wind turbines, solar arrays and batteries for elect and electric cars to meet mandates and get money and gifts from the government. Electric car uses about 400% more copper, just copper mm -hmm. than a regular car. If you make millions of cars that way, you get the millions of tons. It's not complicated. <laughs> you make tens right. of millions of cars that are electric. You're now, you're now consuming half the goals for electric vehicles would consume half of all the world's current copper production. I just saw the Biden administration canceled a big copper mine last year um, yeah. in Arizona. In a, in a nickel one this year. Yeah. And so I'm another one of my hats is a renewable energy diesel company. And uh, the pyrolysis machines are very nickel intensive and stainless. And our budget just went up by. Um, eight figures. <laughs> thanks to okay. That was thanks to Mr. Putin. You know, that was the Ukraine. Well, yeah. Well, that's Ukraine. But, but what's happened is what is what most people haven't noticed if is let, let's let's do some facts, not aspirations. So because of incredible engineering progress, solar cells have gotten cheaper, solar modules. Mm -hmm. what, that, what that means in the in the engineering world is that we engineered out the overhead labor, uh, all the costs of assembling. And so now you're at a point where the cost to make a solar module, 60 to 70 percent of the cost of the solar module is in the bill of materials, the raw materials. The same is true for batteries, but 60 to 70 percent of the cost to make a battery is of the chemicals materials you buy. Right. For wind turbines, it's about 20 percent because they're just clunky, big mechanical machines. But still, a lot of steel and a lot of uh, metals and minerals. And yeah. because of that, and because of minerals inflation, all three of those have gotten more expensive. Even right. though we're being told they're going to get cheaper every day, solar modules are now 50% more expensive than two years ago. Battery costs stopped declining this year. They're going to go up. Wind turbine costs stopped declining two years ago. They're going up. So the choice of the wind turbine manufacturers who are now losing money is to raise the cost of the wind turbines or go out of business. You know what they're going to do. Yeah. So this, this, this myth, and this is a really insidious myth, that somehow the sun is free and therefore just build enough solar panels and you have free electricity. I mean, I'm simplifying, but, uh -huh. and it's not, first the sun is free, so is oil. Nobody made oil, invented it, or natural gas. It exists in nature. We have to build machines to extract and convert it into a useful form, exactly as you do with the wind and sun. Uh -huh. So the only thing that matters in engineering economics is what kind of machines, how long do right. they last? Right. It's capex and opex. It's your how much do you how much of the machines do you have to build, and then how much does it cost you to run them? Well, you you start with capex because capital is precious, right? And then yeah. then opex, then opex. You can engineer out, out a lot of opex. Engineers are good at that. You yeah, can, you that keeps going down for all kinds of machines. We get better all the time at opex. Right, but that's the advantage of solar is that once it's since I just signed up for solar this week. In fact, and the company did they stiffed me this morning. They were supposed to come out to my house right before the podcast, and they didn't. So I'm not happy with that. But uh, once you install it, there's not a lot of cost, right? But if you have a, well, I, well, a combustion well, engine, there's maintenance costs and stuff. They're, they're hidden costs. That's not so. Look, first of all, anybody that wants to install solar, this is the time to do it before the subsidies are taken away. Yeah, as a practical matter. So it, when other people are paying for your solar, I mean, and parts of your electric car, whatever, it's it would be, it's like twenty dollars on the ground. You should pick it up. Right. Uh, but as a as a as a practical matter. Solar arrays, especially at utility scale, you can't build enough solar arrays on people's roofs to power yeah. civilization. Solar arrays at utility scale last a, low, a shorter time than gas turbines at utility scale. 
-hmm. They wear out, they photodegrade in about 20 years and they're garbage and it can't be recycled. They're actually just garbage. Right. So that's problem one. So the capital cost is now misreported. It's double right. that. You, you just push in the future. They right. do have maintenance at utility scale. Uh, first, you have, to, you have to clean them. There's actual mm -hmm. electrical operational maintenance. The power electronics equipments frequently fail, have right. to be maintained. So yeah, you don't have a fuel cost, but the fuel cost in a gas turbine is offset by the fact that the capital cost of a gas turbine and getting the gas is so low. So these life cycle cost analyses are, I, I mean, I'm tempted to use the word fraudulent, but they are fundamentally fraudulent because they, right. don't, they don't compare apples and oranges. Right. So you're, you're perfectly fine with a solar array working when it works. You can't run society on energy sources that operate at the convenience of nature. And yeah. batteries are not only not a viable solution at scale, they're profoundly expensive at scale. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting cheaper, they're getting more expensive. Could we invent a, a battery that was 10 times cheaper than what exists today? Yeah, one day, sure. And lots of people spending money on that, but they don't exist yet. Let, let me, there's some other ideas. I, I, uh, I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of work in the energy industry and I had a meeting the other day. Um, a battery is just a way to store energy, right? You make your energy from whatever, and then you yeah. need to store it. So you, you can have like an electrical battery, but yeah, there's yeah. also mechanical ways to do it. There's one where basically while the sun is shining and the solar powers are making electricity, yeah. it, it would raise a giant mass. And then yeah, at night time, you can pump water sure. uphill. And then at nighttime, you have a dam. Yeah, ab Another, absolutely. Another battery is you can have natural gas power plants with yeah. carbon capture. Right, sure. And so there's not as much emissions. And, well, and the alternative is you buy, the alternative is, and here's, I said it at the beginning, yeah. you send a trillion dollars to China. You know, like yeah. we did that, we did that in the 20th century to the Middle East and yeah. how that, how that work out for us. Yeah. I, I, so first on the China thing, you and I are on the same page and I think uh, it's beginning beginning to become obvious to a lot of policymakers, right? In both parties, uh, what the facts are, and right. reversing reversing those facts. Let's just. Re I want to talk about your Fred Flintstone battery in a minute here because <laughs> I'll tell you why I call it the Fred Flintstone battery. Okay. But let's talk about China first. <laughs> it it does matter that, that we, we change the epicenter of dependencies. Obviously, we figured that out. So Germany Germany is seventy percent of its natural gas from Russia, a third of its oil. It turns out that matters. And so when people like me said they shouldn't do Gazprom too, and they should buy US LNG instead. Yeah. You know, I was, I was the minor, uh, I was in the minority of group pre Trump preaching I, that. I said that in 2014. When they took Crimea, I was like, why are we not sending them their gas? It was, okay. a, it's not rocket surgery. Right. No. Well, it turns out our gas is more expensive than Gazprom gas because there's just delivered in pipes. Right. And, and, and I, I did the calculation and published it in the Wall Street Journal piece at the time. And pointed out that if you took exactly the amount of gas in Gazprom too, as U.S. LNG, it would cost the European Union more than that Gazprom gas. Yes, but it would amount to three percent increase in the total cost of all energy imports for Europe to delink themselves from Gazprom too. Three percent mm -hmm. penalty. So mm -hmm. I, I would say, as a geopolitical trade, that was a bargain, and they should have taken. They didn't. Of course. So I, now I, that's what I'm saying now. Okay, so now we're going to make the same trade. We're going to say, let's build more of, of all this stuff immediately to uh, reduce both Russian dependencies for Europe and ultimately to meet these other goals of quote, transition. And you're absolutely right. What that would do is shift the supply chain dependencies principally to China for the critical uh, process materials into <clears throat> China and a lot of other countries. Some of them are friends, Canada, Australia, and to a great extent, Brazil, there's some, some places where we will get minerals and we are getting minerals that are our friends, but majority of the dependencies would shift and the, the relative dependency would double to China. So how do you stop that? Well, you don't do that by buying more of their stuff in a hurry, which is mm -hmm. what everybody's proposing. Right. You don't, I mean, this is crazy. And you can't do it by it's building insane. Fred Flintstone batteries or to be kind, <laughs> not being mean to your family. You mean the ma the mass, the potential Lift energy blocks better? up and run them downhill. Look, here's here's the problem. So why why don't why doesn't that work? I didn't look into it. It just I well, I, I was pitched it and I was like that sounds intriguing. Well, of course it works. Yeah. So this is not the issue. Is never does it work? The thing about energy stuff is there's a, especially with storage, you can store things as potential energy, 
Yeah, if, it's if a train UGH, up a hill, right, water up right. a hill. You can you can you can you can store it as, you know, in a sterile loop of rubber bands, literally, which is what a air, what compressed air storage is. It's is a compression. It's like a I would call it a gas rubber band storage. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. When you compress air, <clears throat> you can compress. You can you can store energy in uh, thermal form by either making ice blocks for cooling mm -hmm. or heating up rocks. Mm -hmm. You can store it electrochemically. You can store it electrophysically. In, in the pantheon of, of ways energy is stored in our universe, it's a much bigger, it's a really big suite of stuff. And you can build machines that will do those things. So if you wanna dive deep into it, we can do this, but this, let me just make an assertion that we could do, we could spend our time doing now, or can, we can, all of them, all of them are profoundly, not a little bit more, profoundly more expensive, than simply storing oil in a barrel. By I say profoundly, I mean by factors of a hundred, not hundred percent, by a factor of a hundred more expensive to store a barrel of oil, a BCF of gas, a, a pile of coal. So, we, or when you store things, humanity has always had to store com consumables, food and fuel. Uh -huh. So we store grains, we store all kinds of stuff, consumables, uh -huh. not. <clears throat> things that degrade are easy, not that don't degrade are easy to store. Right. Energy has a tendency, as you know, because it's energy to uh, uh, go away if you, if you don't, if you don't right. store it in clever ways. All right. these clever, clever ways um, have capital costs that result in operating costs and they have OPEX costs, by the way. Right. Big right. mechanical things with big motors, running cables, pulling a rock up and then dropping it down are profoundly expensive way at scale to store energy and they do not compete with conventional storage, which is you build a gas turbine or a diesel, a, you know, a, a diesel cat diesel, you know, a cat, a caterpillar diesel generator. If you want to store energy and you want the cheapest possible way to store energy for backup, bar none, it's an oil tank in the ground, a cat diesel, which runs by the way, at these days at 75% thermodynamic efficiency, incredibly efficient, small mm -hmm. footprint and quiet. And that is between 50 and a hundred fold cheaper way to store energy for when you don't have power, when you, you know, the grids down, <clears throat> sunsets, whatever it is. Every other mechanism, all of them cost more. They could all be built. And, and I've seen, like you, I've probably seen a thousand pitches over the last 20 right. years right. of some magic energy storage. Right. And none of them, well, that's not true. A few violate the laws of physics and you can <laughs> ignore them. Right. Uh, they all have uh, round trip costs that are high. Their energy efficiencies are extremely low. Uh, lithium batteries are pretty darn good on an operating basis. They only waste 20% of their energy, but they waste wow. 20%. Right. Uh, your your uh, Thread Flintstone machine, it, it might operate at 60% efficiency. So you waste 40%. Right. But, you know, people say, oh, well, electricity is free when nobody's using it. So I'm just going to raise the rocks right. with free electricity. Right. N nothing's free. Right. The engineering economics don't make it free. The tax. But you have to build solar. twice as many. You have to build twice as many solar panels because you have to power yourself when they're running, and then you you have the other half raises. Is the right? There's no free lunch. Well, well actually, it's, it comes it's, it's it comes down to dollars per kilowatt hour, really, and also emissions right. because the. I mean, well, you okay, when you count there, the emissions, you build enough steel, enough concrete, enough. So when you go upstream to these low energy density means for storing energy. It's just the same as means of producing energy. As you go to lower density things, right. you have to go upstream and use more materials, right. all of which use energy, right. most of which is oil, gas, and coal. Creates world, a mess. The, you know, mine, mining mines industry, are not pretty. Right. Mining industry is about as much oil as the world aviation industry. So how about so this comes back to my second thesis is that the best way to have a battery, if you're gonna is natural gas power plant with carbon capture. That's not a bad, I mean, that's not a battery, it, but I get you. But it, it could work at nighttime when this, when the sun's not shining, I guess. Well, when it's not a battery, then your, your best thing to do is don't build the wind solar array in the first place. Cause if you cycle it, so here's, let's go, let's use that model. This yeah. is the one that's always been it's being proposed is that I'm going to build a backup gas fired power plants or it doesn't matter what it is. It's right. a power plant that I'm going to do carbon capture on. There's lots of chemical ways to capture carbon dioxide. It's a very reactive gas, as you know. Mm -hmm. It's easy to capture. It just costs money. Mm -hmm. So I can burn oil. I can burn coal. I can burn gas. It turns out gas is the easiest one to burn because it produces the less carbon dioxide. So right. you don't have to spend as much money capturing it. Okay. Right. So you're going to spend capital on a, on a power plant that you want to use half as often as it's designed to use, roughly. 
actually uh, about a third as often as it's designed to use. So the actual cost of operating the plant, you just tripled it. The real delivered energy cost of that gas fired turbine has now been tripled. It's not the, the, the cost of natural gas fired electricity is one of the cheapest in the world. It is because those power plants run at about 90% operating load. Right. If you run them at 30% of the time, I'm going to be generous and assume you're a part of the world where the sun is available 30% of the time. So the other two thirds of the time, I need my gas turbine with carbon capture. Right. So I'm cycling it twice as often, which is right. bad for maintenance. Right. It doubles its cost. Right. And if it's in Germany or the Northern latitudes where the solar capacity factors for their utility scale solar, this is public data, about 10%. Wow. So a gigawatt of, of sun is delivering 10th of a gigawatt over the year. So I have to build enough backup. So that's what Germany's done. You know, if you look at the data, Germany has built two grids, essentially. They built a wind and solar grid that's roughly the same size as their conventional grid. And they, they give preference to running the wind and solar grid for political reasons. They say carbon reasons, but that's a fiction given upstream stuff. But I understand why they're doing it. And they have the other grid. So now you have two grids. One of them is running suboptimally. So you, you've doubled your CapEx, even after the same cost in capital, and they're not, but assume mm -hmm. they were. You've doubled your CapEx and you've increased your OpEx because you're not using fuel in the gas turbines and the coal plants, but you're making them inefficient to operate and you're amortizing their capital costs over fewer kilowatt hours. So they're right. more expensive. <clears throat> that should show up in electric rates and it does. So Germans, elect Germans electric rates are triple America's, triple. Yeah, my my taxes. friend in the yeah in the UK, he's, his electric bill just the producer of this podcast, his uh, electric bill just tripled this last month because of Russia and and you and natural gas from Ukraine. Anyway, well, he got he, so the the reason that happened is related to the same decisions. If if in fact uh, they chose to use EU domestic gas, let's just say they weren't shutting the Netherlands down and the North Sea and they allowed uh, domestic exploration on the continent of Europe, then they wouldn't have had the price spike. The price spike started before Putin's invasion, as you uh -huh. know. It happened because of an, an event. We want to talk about another problem with widespread use of wind and sun. It happened because Europe last fall had a wind drought. So in the meteorological community, now we talk about wind and solar droughts. They had a 10-day period. The entire North Sea had essentially no wind. It was becalmed for 10 days. Wow. Not overnight, not for a day. Right. So all of the power generators are panicked trying to buy on spot markets. Right. Gas, coal, and oil. Sweden has one of the world's biggest oil-fired electric power plants, 900 hmm. megawatt oil-fired wow. power plant. And, wow. you, and why is it there? Well, you want to keep the lights on. What would you do? Come, come back to where I start. You, you would build a power plant that you'd use episodically with the cheapest possible way of storing energy, which would be oil. Oil, it's yeah. In the ground. It's cheap. It's easy to get a hold of. It's fungible. It uh, doesn't degrade easily. It's very easy to keep. Uh, so these, these kinds of uh, conflations of what is theoretically possible mm -hmm. in physics and engineering right. versus what is scalable for society I mean, we've, we're, we've doing the experiment. It's, we're going to end up like Germany with, uh, with a grid that will be triple the cost where we are today. We'll follow. And this let's to be clear. People say that won't be triple the cost because solar and wind are getting cheaper. I'm going to wind back to what I said earlier. They're not, they went up in price. What's say it again. What is triple the cost? The cost of residential electricity in Germany is triple okay. America. Oh, and that's okay. because of how they run their grid. So right. what, what a lot of advocates say is, look, we'll build our, the solar and wind arrays we're going to build in the future will be cheaper because the stuff gets cheaper all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it doesn't get cheap all the time. It's getting more expensive recently. The only way the cost curves will start coming back down again is taking commodity price inflation off the equation. And the only way the commodity price inflation comes off the equation, there's only two ways. There's only two paths. Demand. Supply and demand. Yeah. Demand can go away by a depression. That'll solve right. the problem. Right. Always does. Right. Increased supply. So mining, increased supply. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about mines. Um, the global average to open a new mine, IEA data, in the world is 16 years. In America, it's 
30 years to infinite because we ban them. Uh-huh. If you're if, if you're in a friendly country where you can bribe people and they have lax regulations, <laughs> you can probably do it in six to 10 years. Right. Which is what the Chinese are doing in their Belt right. Road project. Right. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. I'm, you know, the problem that, that that we're, you know, we're exploring here is this, this, um, and we see this, you and I both, when we get proposals, we're going to, I'm going to store electricity with this new kind yeah. of battery. Yeah. Okay. It probably works. And, 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 and though, and the, somebody, well, it doesn't use cobalt, it doesn't use nickel, make like a lithium iron phosphate batteries. I, I know a fair bit about lithium iron phosphate batteries. For a while, I ran a factory that made lithium iron phosphate oh, batteries. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and they're great. It's a great technology, which the Chinese, the Chinese are responsible for perfecting. Good on them. They spent billions of dollars trying to develop that chemistry along with Quebec Hydro. So the, the invention of a, a viable lithium iron phosphate battery is due to the research department of Quebec Hydro. Uh, who knew? And why did they do that? Because they have massive hydro dams, which are hard to cycle. And so they have massive research departments focused on things like electric storage. And, you know, w- one day they will be, you know, a lot cheaper uh, than they are today, I guess, if we build enough mines and, uh, and have enough manufacturing capacity, but not, not in the timeframes that our politicians are spending money on. The money we're gonna spend next year to build all this expanded capacity the world is promising to build is an inflationary, deeply inflationary. In inflationary. Inflationary. Yeah, of course. It's fueling broad inflation. It's fueling energy inflation and broad inflation. When the administration said that they wanted to uh, increase, they wanted to generate 50% of our electricity from solar. Remember, that was like a, a year ago they were saying that. Yeah. It, it made my head explode to think of the, uh, we've, we've been talking about this for 30 minutes. I mean, that, that's it's just not. How can I help? Oh, I, this is so Excellent, Mark. The, the things that you're saying, it's such an important topic and you can't just make a tweet about it because there's some really deep issues that you have to think through and talk through. There, it, it's not it's not just let's do wind and solar. Oil and gas is evil. It's not that at all. And wind and solar is creating a massive year 2040 landfill problem, like you mentioned before. It's not recyclable. It's just huge amounts of infinite waste. Um, Well, that and plus the batteries for electric cars, which are very difficult to recycle and dismantle because they're energized. So usually a technician takes one to two hours per battery, per technician. Think about the recycling costs of this, which is not built into the cost of your car. So somewhere, somebody is either going to just have a big pile of gigatons of used batteries or we're going to spend a lot of money trying to dismantle them. Ele- uh, electrified used batteries. Well, that's the problem. See what, yeah, that's an you, interesting problem. If you, you know, if you talk to people in the electric business, as you know, whenever there's electricity, because it's inconveniently invisible, <laughs> it's really, you, I mean, I used to do real things, build things <laughs> at patents. <laughs> I used to build power supplies and radios cool. and right. And, in, you know, actually did missile guidance, missile defense work. And oh, wow. the, first, the first patent was um, for the um, uh, large scale integration. And then I went to the missile defense group, and R- RCA, and uh, worked on the Hellfire team, made oh, the wow. first, de- first detector for Hellfire. I used to do real things with these hands, you know. And, uh-huh. <laughs> but <laughs> Now you're at a think tank. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thinking about doing real things again. I don't know. <laughs> I really do admire people who build things and do things because I, I, I once, once did that. It's very hard. To build businesses, which is why Elon Musk is so impressive because he's built businesses that build hardware. You know how damned hard it is to build spaceships. And yeah. you, you can't explain it away with subsidies. Right. Subsidies help a bit, but they don't they don't make the job easier. He has to build something that works. Same with his cars. Right. They, they really Very complicated work. things to work, yeah. Very, and, and to be work reliably and, and, and safely. But it's, a, um, it's an interesting problem to your point that um, you go down, you have to go down all these rabbit holes that are digressions from the main aspiration when, when someone would respond, well, we just have to do this. You know, we need more windmills because you can't be, keep burning gas. And I said, okay, you can say that, but if you're the person in charge of building them and paying for them, uh, skip the siting issue and whether there's, there's a lot of opposition to the scale of these 
wind farms now, but I, I happen to like how they look. It's just me. I mean, I, I think fields of wind turbines that go to the horizon are an amazing engineering accomplishment. I don't know if I want them to look at every day for my vacation place, but right. That's it, uh, it's cool. Like in the corner of New Mexico or West Texas, you drive. I it's I love driving through West Texas because there's these wind farms, but I also ooh, don't yeah. have to, I don't have to see them every day. Like yeah. in Ger- Germany, really is the land of milk and honey. It was this idyllic place with farm fields. Now there's windmills everywhere. They ruin their their look. And the, like you said, the grid, they had to build all these where you have line losses, inefficient trans, power transmission lines. That, that And the thing that I, I want to talk about next is nuclear. And Fukushima happened. It was this terrible tsunami, earthquake. Um, all of the deaths there were from the tsunami mostly and the earthquake, the, the nuclear power plant didn't kill anybody. It, right. The waste was bad, but you know, the lesson from Fukushima, I think was don't build nuclear power plants on fault lines by the <laughs> sea, where, by the sea where they have tsunamis, right? And Germany, that's a nation of smart people. I live there. It's one of my favorite yeah. places on the yeah. planet. I am German, I, Verts, you know, they all had this rush to get rid of their nuclear power plant. So then they immediately started buying electricity from the Czech Republic. Right. From, from their Chernobyl Model 1A nuclear power plant. Right. 40 kilometers across the border. How, it's insane. How does it that is, make sense? It's insanity. Yeah, it is. It's insanity. And so much of our energy policy <clears throat> is driven by emotion and ideology and not science. And that's what it makes my head explode because I, I saw this from Space Mark. I, and I've told the story all the time. Now, now but, you're saying things that make me crazy jealous. <laughs> well, you can go. My, my buddy's going up on a, one of these space tourist things. You can do it. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Wait, come, I got my suit. Uh, with the think, just tell the think tank to send you up there and you'll write, you'll write better papers when you get back. Go ahead. I'm sorry um, to interrupt you. <laughs> so I'm in space for a few days and I've told this story a million times. And I realized that you can't see people during the daylight, but at nighttime you can. I yeah. don't have any, you know, city lights is what oh, you yeah. see. And after I thought about it for a while, I'm like, you know, what I'm looking at is not population. I'm looking at wealth and energy is the key to human life, right? Like if you want everything that makes quality of life better, you need energy. And you could see that very obviously from space. Because you saw Africa and it's dark and you, and you saw most of Asia, except for Mumbai and few cities dark. And Mm -hmm. you see South America and except for the the penumbra cities dark. The, So the single most interesting thing about energy, what got me involved in the business after I, you know, when I was, I was in semiconductors and missile guidance early in my career, then I ended up in the nuclear industry, as it turned out, in Canada, working for Canada's nuclear refiner and uranium miner, and ended up in the United States. And it's relevant to your, to your point about nuclear energy. Within a couple of months of arriving in the United States as a kid, I felt like I was an adult then, but in, (laughs) in the hindsight of age. Right. I was a kid, uh, Three Mile Island happened here and I was right. at the site of the accident for most of the week of the accident. Oh, wow. And then I spent the next, I guess, seven years of my life defending the virtues of nuclear energy, both uh, right. on the road, debating, arguing, fighting the crazies, arguing with the, the loons who thought we're all gonna die any minute from nuclear You mean Three energy. Mile Island where all those people died and it's uninhabitable now and it was a massive disaster? Yeah. I'm being facetious. I know. It's, <laughs> I saw, <laughs> so the, the logic yeah. test I did for, for um, a colleagues who don't know much about nuclear energy, well, <clears throat> was this. Can you imagine, I'll do it in today's dollars because at that time, could you imagine a uh, industrial accident? Because that's what it was. Right. That cost $5 billion, destroyed a $5 billion piece of industrial operations. And in the process of utterly destroying $5 billion of hardware, Killed not a single worker, didn't cause a single workplace injury, didn't injure a single member of the public. There's never been an industrial accident of that scale with no injuries or death. <clears throat> now, why was that? Well, as I kept trying to tell the media at the time, it's because your China syndrome myth, the movie China syndrome had just right. come out one month before, yeah, yeah. yeah, one month before Three Mile Island, you know, J- uh, Jane Fonda yeah. and Jack Lemmon, China syndrome. Yeah. Yep. Which I was sent to New York to preview. Oh my I was gosh. a science advisor to the nuclear industry at the time as a kid. That wasn't my <laughs> title, but that's what I did. Right. And, uh, and I wrote a review of it and I said, 
I, you know, I kind of like Jane Fonda and I don't, not about her politics, just, just right. fine. She's and it was actress. a kind of fun movie adventure. Right. Be a classic Hollywood B plus movie with, you know, star, star actors. And of course right. the, the thesis of the movie was the day we, the day we almost lost Pennsylvania, of course, three mile Island, Island happened and Thornburg governor at the time issued a precautionary evacuation from the area, which panicked everybody because in their heads, it's a nuclear bomb is going to happen. Right. So, which is physically impossible. Uh, right. It's not a design feature. You, you can't have a nuclear explosion. Right. right. But so in the phenomenologies of energy, nothing isn't close. The, the, the distance from wood to oil is big in terms of the energetic values of oil over wood. It's right. huge, right? right? From wood to coal is big. Coal, but the distance from oil and gas and, and I'm ignoring wind and solar because they're 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 no better than wood, right. generally speaking, as, a, as, as a, a, in a broad economic sense for, for energy. Right. They they fit that they fit that in that sort of pantheon. Right. They're or put be more kind. They're more they're more equivalent to biodiesel. There, there's a market for biodiesel. It's not going to replace diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. There's a market for it, mm -hmm. and it'll be significant. And there's a market for wind and solar. It'll right. be significant, but the distance. In energetic terms and economic terms and materials terms, land use terms to nuclear is a leap that's more than twice. It, you know, you're talking about a 10x gain in all the functional things that matter to keep society powered when you go nuclear. It's a right. phenomenology of from as I, you know, I you, know, you try to explain it. A pound of a pound of oil is the most energy dense thing you can get other than the pound of liquid hydrogen. And right. if I burden liquid hydrogen with what it takes to keep it cold. The oil wins, right? Wow, wow! Oil wins because you got to right. keep the liquid hydrogen cold. Minus four hundred and some Fahrenheit. It's super cold. Yeah, yeah but it takes a lot of money and energy and weight to keep it that cold. Right, exactly. But a pound of nuclear fuel is equal to sixty thousand pounds of oil. So wow, sixty thousand. And by the way, a million, a million Tesla batteries. So one pound of nuclear fuel holds the energy of a million Teslas. So yeah. what's, what's not the love, except, except the a waste. lot of mythology, uh, the waste is, this is a, a, a deep if, misdirection and made if only up we had a place where we could store the waste safely and permanently. Oh, oh, oh say like on the reactor site itself or in, con in concrete or, where it can't or, fly <laughs> where it is right you, now. Or Yucca. We had Yucca mountain. Um, you don't need Yucca. You, you just here, store, here, yeah. Here's the question we've had. We've, we got a hundred plus reactors in America. We've got, we make give or take 15% of electricity from nuclear power. We've had them now for 40 plus years. Where's the nuclear waste? I mean, are we still drowning in nuclear waste? All of right. it's essentially stored on site. Right. And why, is it, why can you store it on site? Well, because if I provided all your electricity, all of it from nuclear energy, your lifetime accumulation, you or me, mm -hmm. is the, the volume of about tip of your finger, little finger. That's your, li your personal lifetime accumulation of waste. If I, if I were to pick all of your electricity from solar panels for your lifetime, I'll have to do the math on this because I haven't. But I think if I were shooting from the hip, it would probably occupy a volume roughly equal to the Empire State Building. For And what was that for? Your, oh. your personal consumption of electricity over your right. lifetime. Right. Nuclear powered, volume of waste, tip of your little finger. Is a finger, yeah. For all solar. And I'll, I'll pledge to do the calculation ex post facto, right. shooting from the hip in terms of the volumes that I know, it's probably something like the Empire State Building per person of waste to provide all your electricity for your life if it's just solar. It's going to be a number like that. That is so. So why? Do, and oh, let's, let's, let's carry on with this. Yeah. Why is nuclear waste so frightening? Yeah. It's radioactive. Right. No kidding. All right, but it's a physical solid, ceramic-like. It can't melt, it can't dissolve, you can't eat it, it, it can't run away, it can't fly. It, uranium is denser than lead, um, right? As you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, so they, it, doesn't, it's a great, it doesn't, makes a great bullet. Right? Well, yes, I know. I worked goes in that through, program. goes through tanks, yeah. It goes through tanks like the proverbial hot knife through butter. But, right, because exactly. Because it's also pyrophoric. So when it hits, mm -hmm. it uh, turns like a magnesium flare into a... Uh, right into hot metal. It's a beautiful thing. It, it, well, if you're trying to kill bad guy tanks, it's, yeah. a, it's yeah. a wonderful thing. Yeah. So it's tiny. The fact that it's radioactive 
means that it's easy to monitor. That's, this is the inverse irony. If, if I want to monitor a pollutant in the environment, this is what mm -hmm. scientists do. We tag the chemical with a tiny amount of radioactivity, mm -hmm. trivial amount of radioactivity. In fact, we can measure radioactivity levels down to an atom. Uh, we have instruments that are so sensitive that it's easy to trace chemicals in your body. When you do a radioimmunoassay, for those who have heard it, that look at thyroid function, which many people take, mm -hmm. what that does is it tags key chemicals in your body with radioiodine, which is harmless to you, but it allows you to track it, exquisite perfection, take pictures of your thyroid function, see how your, your body is, is handling uh, the chemicals that are associated with your, your thyroid. So I, I point that out not as a digression because radioactivity is exquisitely easy to measure at incredibly low, non-harmful, I mean, profoundly non-harmful levels. The universe is radioactive, everything around us is radioactive, but we can, we can discern this. So now tiny volumes, easy to monitor, <laughs> easy to store. You know, the waste problem is genuinely uh, one of the most profound made up yeah. type problems. I mean, a lot of things are, are hyped, you know, the, the dangers of plastic waste are hyped, but who wants waste in the oceans, obviously, but the, the hazards are hyped, but there are some hazards, right. but nothing like the hype that's been uh, attached to uh, nuclear waste. Nuclear waste, the, the Yucca Mountain thing I bring up for those who don't know, probably 15 years ago or something, there's a there's a site in Nevada and I've flown F-16s there. It is the middle of nowhere. I made a mistake one time. I flew, I flew through the old nuclear testing ground and I looked around, there's all these giant divots and then I got in trouble. You're not allowed to fly and we call it the box, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So, they, so now you just said something else to interrupt you that really yeah. annoys me. You, you fly F-16s. <laughs> I mean, that, damn. You're gonna that was pretty me. cool. Are you still, are you still qualified? No, I haven't flown them for a few years. I was supposed to get a ride last summer at Luke Air Force Base, and they they were like, "Oh, you've already flown them. You don't need another ride." I want to ride in one. I've never had a what a you what should a, what I, a machine. I it's the best oh. airplane ever made. I highly recommend it. But the point anyway, is, that, so you flew over in the in the, in the no go zone. <laughs> there's a reason why they were going to store nuclear. It is in the middle of nowhere. It it would be safe for tens of thousands of years. And Harry yeah. Reid, Harry Reid canceled it because of ideology, emotional yeah. things. Yeah. But yeah. so there's the fuel waste that's yeah. you're saying it's not very dangerous, but there's also, well, no, liquid, there's it's liquid very dangerous waste, if right? you hold it in your hand. Well, yeah, you don't want to sleep with it, a <laughs> rod in your well, bed. Yeah. Why? That's not going to happen in any Exactly. Way. Exactly. Now, if it got stolen by terrorists, that would be bad. So it has to be guarded. Easy to guard, small volumes. Right. It's, it's not as bad as you think if it's stolen by terrorists. Right. We, we actually know this because the Chechen terrorists tried to do this. Uh, and what happens is if you try to get ready radioactive stuff and carry it away, it kills the terrorists. <laughs> it's, it's like a self uh, self hedging uh, problem. Yeah. I would well, encourage them to steal it. That's that's where I, I go the opposite direction, frankly. There's also liquid waste, though, right? From the cooling water that was yeah. there. The tr I mean, the, yes, but this this are these are. Cooling water does not have any radioactivity in it, but there's, there's, there is, um, there are, because you have a lot of uh, liquids and, and materials and you can get small leaks. So there's, there's what's called low level radioactive waste associated with, with uh, all nuclear operations of all kinds. Uh, right. These are, again, are small in volume, but they're extremely low levels of radioactivity, the potential for harm from those. They're easy to put in landfill right. and guard. And they, they're not the kinds of things that you can, that can cause any kind of uh, significant hazard. Right. But they're not a, the emissions that other plants make do cause problems, right? Well, so, that, well, of course they do. You have to yeah. protect yourself. R yeah. Radiation is, um, is not a mysterious thing. Um, right. In the sense that it's, it's, it's a form of electromagnetic energy. Right. So the, the way one finds, I find it easier to explain to, especially students when I was doing that back in the day, is that if I have a flashlight and I turn it on, it emits radiation radiation that I can see. And if I make the flashlight intense enough, <laughs> and you know this, not only can I see through your hand, if, if any kid that's done right. this, you can, if I make it even more intense, I can strip paint off of aircraft, which the Air Force right. does. Right. And if I make it more intense, I can burn you with light. Right. Uh, radiation is the same. It's no different. It's just another wavelength. And right. at low levels, it's harmless. At high levels, it can kill you, but you can't get near the high levels. So it's, it's a manufactured myth, which in the environmental movement of 
use that for, for four decades to, to destroy the commercial nuclear industry in the United States. Yes. And, and I, I see glimmers of hope, glimmers, there's still a huge opposition to commercial nuclear energy, but there's glimmers of hope in corners of the environmental movement to uh, support it. The problem is the collateral requirements to do something, to develop a viable commercial nuclear reactor, a new generation of reactors, requires efforts of, that no one is undertaking right. anywhere. Billion, billions of CapEx. And, but the French do. The French build it so well, we can partner with them. They well, power Macron, the whole Macron country. Has, Macron has pledged to build a dozen more, and Le Pen has seen it and raised them double that. And what they'll be able to do in, in the decade when they get them done, it'll take probably a decade, <clears throat> they'll be able to replace a significant share of all Russia's gas that goes into electric generation. Mm -hmm. Five to ten years from now, if they do a, if they do a warp speed program to new to use a now politicized word, but but it was still Germany had years. that Germany had that and they got rid of it right uh, so the, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a silly we could buy those from France to as a as a bone or, or you know consul, consolation prize to the um, <laughs> the, the, the submarines the submarine the submarine 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 yeah there's a good idea the, the amount of time it yeah. would take us to spool up our industry again, which will take time. Yeah. In the meantime, what we could do is issue contracts to, to Framilton. I doubt they could handle the workload of building a two dozen French reactors and another two dozen here, but maybe they could. We could build them under license or something like that. You know, there there's. Yeah. It takes more than it's it, their designs and art. The issue is the issue is not the license. It's not an IP problem. Right. This is, this is a uh, engineering problem. You have to have the manpower, the qualified Right. Nuclear qualification, nuclear welding qualifications are different than other qualifications. Right. So that whole ecosystem would have to be rebuilt. And we largely dismantled it in the United States. It still, it still exists for our nuclear Navy. Yeah. And yeah. we could expand on that skill set, but it takes time to qualify people. It does, yeah. And it's something that we need to do because five or 10 years from now, when China invades Taiwan and they're... Right. We... We can sanction Russia and it hurts us, but it doesn't kill us. But sanctioning China on that level would destroy our economy. And so the leverage we have over them is very right. little compared to what we have over Russia. Well, we have bilateral leverage, actually. China's situation is interesting, but let's finish with nukes. Yeah. I have a funny F-16 story. Oh, I want to hear that. That's so much, much better than nuke stories. I want to hear this. Well, it's a, it is a nuke story. It, it, well, I did one of my missions in the F-16 was nuke. <laughs> I had a, I was in Europe doing B-61 nukes, um, but the uh, Homestead Air Force Base had Turkey yeah. Point nuclear power plant. And yeah. I was yeah. taken yeah. off one day, I got an oil light, which is super bad. It means your engine's about to seize and you're about to become, you're about <laughs> to become say, a glider. Yeah, that's not good. And you don't want to glide that thing into the Turkey Point uh, dome. So, and I was, it was an exercise. I had bombs and fuel tanks and the step one is hit the emergency jettison and get rid of them. And I was like, the thought, the, fir the first thought that went through my mind is I'm going to be on CNN tonight because I'm about to bomb Turkey Point nuclear power plant. <laughs> so like I, I looked out, I could see it. I turned away, jettisoned. And anyway, I came back and landed. And um, so that was episode one. And then a few months later, Hurricane Andrew hit and we did our water survival at Homestead and there was a canal. And yeah. I remember floating in the thing, you know, if you, if you eject over water, you have to do the stuff and it was in the the where the cooling water was for turkey point yeah and there were all of these bizarre looking jellyfish things and i remember thinking this is just like the simpsons you know the two-headed fish yeah, yeah. And stuff. But, yeah but anyway so hurricane andrew hit worst hurricane to ever hit america the eye of this category five monster um Whoa. went right over turkey point nothing happens it was fine Popkiss, nothing. It was fine. Of course. Don't, don't build them on earthquake fault lines or volcanoes or tsunamis. Well, here and, and you'll be fine. So th you'll something fine. You, you you as a as a you understand uh, efficacy of bombs, and I did yeah. more research on bombs than I would care to confess. <laughs> back in my Cold Warrior days, as yeah. a former Cold Warrior, so the containment domes in Turkey Point in these commercial nuclear power plants are order of magnitude eight foot thick reinforced concrete and steel so if you look at the, that's a lot yeah that's i would i would say i i don't know what what your ordinance load was the probability that you could penetrate the domes is zero it was zero if they were mark 82s five and yeah. they, it wasn't real bombs it was an, it was just concrete inert yeah. training right bombs. right yeah. they're, they're, but, but even I, if they were real bombs 
they 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 would have they could have cracked you could crack the dome these right. are these are these are these are uh, more robust than hitler's bunkers which none of the ordnance could touch right. as you know just right. bouncing off so right. and that was deliberate because what the design basis way back in the early nuclear days this is the mit what's called the rasmussen report right. looked at looked at something that has been codified in the military now, and in every all these high risk domains, and for the space program, is these fault tree analysis. Uh -huh. So the fault tree analysis was pioneered essentially for for, for high consequence events hmm. that can can have contemporaneous failures. So so you know, especially as a guy that's flown really complicated, dangerous machines, your risk isn't that one bad thing happens, oil light goes on. Is it something else bad that's unrelated happens coincidentally right. simultaneously? Right. So, and you can even have three things on, uh, this is, it, it, statistically, it's very common, turns out, over history. And so when you build fault tree analyses on complex stuff, you try to figure out what your redundancies are, what your options are. What, one of them is always training. You train your operators to avoid mm -hmm. and recognize. And right. by the way, Three Mile Island's problem was a training and, and cognitive dissonance problem. They, they looked at a meter and thought the meter should be going up. It was actually going they thought the meter was doing something it wasn't doing and they they didn't even visually you know what cognitive dissonance is of course they didn't they didn't know that they were getting a signal to uh le you know to to turn on they turn off the feed water pumps when they should have left them on basically the coolant pumps they right. just turned they thought they should they thought they were doing the right thing so, so training right. training matters and then, of course you build in mechanical electrical redundancies you have you have fault paths and then the third order is that if the, if the two things happen contemporaneously, you have a passive path in the fault tree analysis for which the consequence is less severe than the worst case, right? Now, the relevance to this is the Fukushima thing you said. Mm -hmm. Don't build nuclear plants on fault lines. Actually, you can build, or, or near tsunamis, you can build nuclear plants on fault lines if you follow through the fault tree analysis. We know what earthquakes can do. We know the magnitude of disruptions that can happen. You can, you can actually engineer uh, for a, a once in a millennia earthquake. You could build nuclear plants like that. And Fukushima, by the way, was engineered for a fault line. And I, if there'd been an earthquake, it would have shut down. Nothing would have happened. Right. Here, here's what they did wrong. Here's the, the rub. And I remember going out at the time and then the data came out early on. They did two, they did two dumb things back to my fault tree analysis. <clears throat> and and it, it's shocking how simple and dumb these things were. One was their tsunami. They had a, they had a seawall built for tsunamis. So that if there was a tsunami, they knew there were tsunamis on that part of the world. They built a high sea, I forget it was, 30 foot seawall, it was pretty high to protect the uh, external facilities, you know, the switch gear and all the rest outside, outside the plant, not the building. You can't wash the building away. It's gigatons of concrete. Right. <clears throat> Yet inland from Fukushima, above Fukushima dome are markers in Japan from the heights of which tsunamis have hit. Right. I mean, they didn't have to guess that that wall wasn't gonna do anything because tsunamis, right. had, not just one tsunami. Right. So that was dopey, but the really dopey thing was if, if the tsunami breached the seawall, hmm. so what? You can't wash away, what happened? Well, the nuclear plant went into automatic shutdown because of the faults, which it does. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a auto, auto shutdown. And it brings on the backup feed water pumps, which are diesel fired. The dopes put the diesel generators behind the seawalls on the ground. Right. If they were on top of the containment building, which is where mm -hmm. you would place them when you're way above any, any theoretical tsunami, right. you would never have heard the word Fukushima because right. what would have happened, it was washed in there, washed away the cars and trucks. The plant would have been in cold shutdown, run on coolant from its diesel pumps. And it would have run like that for weeks and you would never have heard the word Fukushima. Right. So this, this is, it's a stunning, st stunning mistake of incredible consequence. But the Crohn's plants, the Fukushima plant are a certain client, a kind of nuclear plant. There are, and I'll use an analogy because you're, you, you have a, you had a profession in aviation, which everybody's, and you have figured out by now, I'm deeply, deeply <laughs> jealous of the, the, Nuclear plants we're building today are the equivalents of 747 or A380s or 777s. The, they're really big. They're extremely efficient when you have an ecosystem that takes big. Mm -hmm. And there's no more efficient way to fly people than a 747 or 777. Right. If you've got to go long distances with 500 right. people. But the fleet of aircraft that services the world 
is dominated by 737 class aircraft. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're roughly, I looked the number up, it's about 80% of the total fleet are 737 or A320s. A320s, yeah. <clears throat> which is basically a, a knockoff, mm -hmm. right? I right. Mean, and why? Well, because in all economic systems and all engineering systems, there's an optimal size. You could say, I can make a fighter jet bigger. Yeah, you could, but it wouldn't be very maneuverable. You got physics problems mm -hmm. or it wouldn't have high utility. It would have fuel loads. There's all, right. there's, there's a, if you do the curve, when you make right. things big, it goes up big. And then you have your utility function on the bottom. And there's all things, whether it's right. human beings, animals, right. trees, they have the same shape curve. There's an optimal for whatever ecosystem they're in, economic or physical. So we don't have nuclear plants that are equal to 737s yet. We have nuclear plants that are equal to 777s or you know, A380s. And so the new generation of smaller reactors that would, would be in the, we'll call it the Embraer right. jet class, regional jet, yeah, which I would call a, a, 10 to, a 10 to 40 watt nuke. And then a 737s would be, let's say the 50 to 100s. Uh, if you can build those at scale, because you can then factory build those, this be and this would be world changing, and we know we can do that because there's a dozen designs in that in that class now. Yeah, and this is a big deal. So could we accelerate that? Well, yeah, a government could do something sensible. We could run a contest the way your old employer runs contests. You do a purchase and down select. You say, look what we'll buy. We the government, we subsidize the hell out of all kinds of stuff. This is the kind of project that that the government is actually good at. We'll buy one of each of 12 designs of reactors that will be from 10 megawatts to 50 meg or 100 megawatts, pick a, pick a range. We'll buy, we'll buy a dozen or by some number and um, we'll qualify them, test them, we'll pay for them, we'll, have, we'll put them on the defense facilities, military bases, the national mm -hmm. labs, whatever. We, right. we'll, own, we'll run them and qualify them and then we'll down select to, you know, two winners in the, uh, original jet class and two winners in the 737 class. Right. And then we, we, the government, to power our facilities, because a 10 megawatt reactor is perfect for, for a base mm -hmm. and a 100 megawatt reactor is perfect for the really big bases. Right. And we'll, we'll buy 100 of these and 200 of these on a purchase order from the, from the four winners. You'd have, an over, you'd, have a, you'd have a commercial nuclear industry of real scale. And these nuclear power plants would have on-off switches they don't have, they don't have fail, failure modes other than they don't work. They can't right. blow up. They can't melt down because of the designs and nature. Right. Of them. You, you really change the world. And now this, this won't happen overnight, but where the hell are the people who want to do this? I mean, everybody's gassing away about transition. First, they won't replace gas, by the way. Let's just right. be clear. Right. But instead of, and it, and it won't eliminate new wind power and solar power, but it'd be the biggest single consequential addition to the electric grids of the world in the next half century than anything we could possibly do and have the tiniest environmental footprint of anything we could do. What uh, oil and, well, gas powered utilities are not a big fan of this, I don't think. I had a guy in my company pitch this idea. He called them micro nukes. And I think the ones he was yeah. talking about were, and what was really interesting, he said that it's completely self contained and it never, the, the waste is self-contained. Like you don't yeah. need to deal with the waste. No, it looks, right. And the amount it made was almost nothing. It was incredible. Right. Yeah. The, re the refuel rates, depending on the design, can be one year to five years or maybe longer. So you, you don't do, you're not running fuel trucks to it. Look, um, I know lots of people in the gas and electric utility industry and the gas utility industry. I think uh, on a macro level, they should embrace, not be worried about it for a very simple reason. By the time we qualify enough of those power plants to be useful, the world's consumption of electricity will have risen so much right. that there's going to be so much room for natural gas domestically right. and globally. And for gas utilities, the problem with these nukes is you can't cycle them. If you wanted to pick, let's just be, you know, we're the rulers of the world and you want to pick the ideal combination for power plants. So simplistically speaking, you'd have a role for a solar and wind in the regions of the world where you have high utility factors, which is mm -hmm. not Germany. It's Arizona or Texas. It's crazy to do them. Germany is like the world's biggest solar country. What, what, you know, it's incredible how much solar. And I lived there for three and a half years. Like the sun don't shine exactly <laughs> all, all winter long. Well, first so of all, the sun, the sun is there. It's barely above the horizon and well, it's do, cloudy do, yeah. all winter. Yeah. yeah. So go to Dr. Google, because you can, don't even have to go to Google yeah. Scholar right. and look up the reported, not, not the anti-solar 
us. There's no anti-solar lobby that I'm aware of, but it doesn't come from Exxon's data. Look at the right. EU data, look at Germany's data for the actual utilization of their solar installations. I don't think I'm wrong. It's in the 10% range, uh -huh. annuals. The annualized utility function, which would mean when, when somebody says solar's cheap, it's only a dollar a watt. No, right. in Germany, that's actually $10 a watt of useful watts. <laughs> right. And that's without storage. So the actual cost of delivering energy is 10 times higher if you, your load factor is 10%. It's just this is this is really embarrassing stuff. But if but doesn't mean there isn't role for solar. But if you imagine, depending on where you are in the world, you can have solar bright regions. You mm -hmm. have nukes running base load with an on-off switch in the ground, and then you have gas or oil, depending on where you physically are, turbines. But mostly, mostly it's going to be gas because oil has other functions. Uh, running the cycling function because society cycles, right? People. People have cycles, economies have cycles, right. and that's a very cheap uh, long-term solution, but it's not a transition. This is the problem. You, you, right. you haven't eliminated the gas, and then it's going to be in a world where, let's just say, in my model, I've roughly reduced the amount of gas I need to use by half, by, by, because the nukes are replacing that base load gas function in some proportion. But I've doubled the amount of electricity the world needs. We know it's going to more than double or triple in the next 20 years. So the net call on gas roughly the same. And if, frankly, if we don't do the other stuff, it's going to be very difficult to supply enough gas. It, it, right. it really, it, it's, the world's going to grow a lot. Yeah. Um, I've seen population this century should go up to maybe 12 billion ish, but then it's supposed to stabilize. Um, I think we're going to hit max population this, according to the, the, whoever, the, the smart people. Yeah, yeah. The demographers, I know I've seen that. But let's setting aside when it when it's when it stabilizes and goes down. Yeah. The, the and we know a lot, the European nations are all in negative growth now anyway. Right. right. They're all disappearing. We're right. still in slight positive growth territory. Yeah. China went to negative growth two years ago. Right. So they're they're shrinking, but the world's still growing. And more. But what's what's even more important? If the world were not growing, the rate of energy demand growth is disproportionately linked to wealth growth. To the point you were making earlier. It, it is. Yeah. By, by a factor of two to three. So if we look just in the hmm. Western nations uh, where we have really, or globally, if you, if you attribute the, you pick a year, let's just pick the year 2000 and the year 2020. If you looked at the increase in consumption of energy in the world, if it went up only by the amount of population, we'd know the number it would have gone up by like 20%, right. but it didn't go up 20%. World's energy demand went up more than 60%. Right. It's a wealth effect. People buy cars, it's, they buy air conditioners, they buy bigger houses, they get food that they were starving before, they wear clothes that they couldn't afford. They go to movies, yeah. they have vacations. I mean- It's, it's really, it's, so it's not just energy times population growth, it's energy times population growth times GDP growth. Right. Um, and, yeah. and the GDP growth one is, is not only far faster, yeah. In my book, which we have we haven't talked, which about. is a good thing. That's what we want. It's a wonderful thing. In my it, book, I'm predicting yeah. we're going to go into faster economic growth, not slower in the future. Yeah. But the good thing about it is it what what does energy do? It provides not survival is not the point. I mean, you need energy to have food and and survive. If that were if that's all you cared about, we'd be living in a pre-industrial times, and you couldn't support the human beings that live on the earth. There'd be mass starvation. But mm -hmm. people want conveniences, comfort, entertainment, safety, beauty, all these features of living a life other than mere survival, yeah. all cost energy. Yeah. It just costs energy. Healthcare costs energy. <clears throat> so you're a fan of all the, and people say this a lot, uh, all of the above. Um, when Republicans say it, they really don't mean wind and solar. And when Democrats say it, they certainly don't mean nuclear. Um, that's right. Or, or gas, you know, so they, everybody says that, but they don't always mean it. But I, I'm honestly a fan of all of the above. It sounds like you are as, as well, just because of the, of course. the, the growth and energy need requirements. But first, that's what the world's always done. Right. The world's right, always- to your first point, exactly. Always used all of the above. Right. And the, the rate of growth of the alternatives is, uh, it could always- unless governments put their finger on the scale, which is what's going on now. But over time, governments can't put their finger on the scale because the scales are too big. Right. Over time, what'll happen is the ratios of the energy uses are dictated by economics because 
lowering costs matters and the economics are dictated by geography. Right. And more, more than another factor, like, to your point about living in Germany versus if you're living in Texas now in terms of the sun's utility. So if the share of the energy that usefully would come from the sun in Texas is much greater than it usefully comes from it in Germany. And that's locked into the planet we live on unless we can figure out a way to move the planet and you know, shift its axis. Right. That'll be, that's the only way you can change that, that right. fact. Right. And, and what we want is more energy for more people because it's life affirming, but it's more than life affirming. All, you know, beat it to death. The things that morally matter to making life better for most people on the planet, the vast majority of people on the planet will require more energy. Yeah. And the quantities of energy required are off the charts and you don't provide more energy by making it more expensive. They can't afford it now. Right. Right. And all the paths the West are pursuing now, as we've already noticed with inflation, are causing energy to get more expensive, not cheaper, right. which I find fundamentally immoral. That's, right. That's the problem with, with policies that make energy more expensive. Right. You're making life more expensive, you know, like, but, and we went through this with um, refrigerants, right? We, we blocked um, CFCs and back in the 90s and the ozone layer repaired itself, which was good, yeah. but it also made refrigeration more expensive, which makes food costs go up, which right. mean, which means in America, I don't get to go to the movies on Friday night, but in Africa, it means your baby dies. And that, that's, that's right. That's, that's a, a, yeah. And those, are, those are the kinds of choices that can't be waved away by saying, oh, well, I'll invent a more efficient refrigerator. Right. Y yes. Yes, you will. They will get invented. I, I follow right. that field rather closely. Some very clever things out there refrigeration is a really difficult thing to do and really important for uh, supply chains, for food. Yeah. And to your point, if you track uh, in warm environments, the death rates and the decline in death rates, especially for children, but also for older people, as air conditioning is introduced, it's dramatic, stark, and obvious as soon as you say it, it's a huge decline. You get rid of mosquitoes, which gets rid of malaria. And 500,000 African yeah. babies die every year. Yeah, yeah all kinds of malaria. things. Yeah. It, it, and it's not like, okay, the energy costs don't have any, you know, to run the air conditioning doesn't have a consequence. Of course it does. Life is full yeah. of trade-offs. You're, you're trying right. to balance these things. And one of the trade-offs you don't want to do, to go back to the macro point, your life-affirming point, it, you may have seen these graphs. If you look at the share of economies, GDP, that was consumed by the acquisition of food and fuel. Food is just human fuel, obviously. Right. For all of history, somewhere between 60 and 90% of every economy through all of history of its economic productive output has been consumed by just acquiring food and fuel. That dropped to 15% between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So we in the West, in the, in the wealthy nations, enjoy having 85% of the share of a much bigger economy available for do everything else except acquire food and fuel for survival. Right. Right. Reversing that is a, a reversal of history of profoundly mis misguided proportions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And that's what we, we need to reduce emissions. We need to stop the climate change and warming, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't hurt people <laughs> which is uh, well, hurting people today yeah. is it I, immoral because you're to, to save a ther theoretical life tomorrow i get the, i get right. the calculus but what we're doing is to be clear on the calculus is a a, a known harm caused today versus right. a possible harm caused sometime in the future real quick about climate change we've, we've been talking about lots of stuff um another thesis of mine People always talk about climate change and that it's absolutely bad in every possible way. And there's certainly lots of bad things about it, but I think there could potentially be some good things about it, especially if you live in Canada and Russia. <laughs> or, um, and, and, yeah. the, and the climate change in the tropics, the temperature increase is mostly a temperate increase that's happening. Right. So the, the tropics aren't hotter. The temperate zones in the north and south are warmer. And they're right. clearly warmer. I mean, this is indisputable yeah. data. The temperate yeah. zones of the, of the planet are warmer. Yeah. But as Russia and, and Canada warm up, a lot more land will be farmable. I, I, I saw a thing yesterday and there was a guy going, we're going to have a lot less farmland. And I was like, have you, like, I've, I've seen Russia and Canada from space. It is white 
from one end of the earth to the other and yeah. then you keep on flying and you're going five miles a second and 20 minutes later it's still nothing but white and nothing but russia it's these countries both countries are huge and, and covered in snow and as they're covered in less snow there's going to be more farmland i you know i flew in a dc4 from Edmonton, Alberta, to the Northwest Territories, to a, to a uranium mine. Wow! So we're at 10,000 10, feet. Really cool airplane, kind of yeah. noisy. I'd much yeah. rather be in an F-16, but anyway. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, was, what are we doing? About 200 knots in a DC-4, maybe? <laughs> maybe. But we flew we flew for that, I guess we was almost 1,000 miles, so you can do the math. We're, we're flying for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Over nothing, nothing but emptiness. First, mm -hmm. it's all, all trees and water. Then it's mm -hmm. just no trees and all water. Right. And it's tundra and water, tundra mm -hmm. and water. In the winter, it's tundra and ice. Right. And, you know, but back to your point, look, the, the climate debate has devolved into a um, parody of political insanity mm -hmm. with hyperbole about existential threats to the planet right. on one hand and hoax on the other hand. So it, we don't have to even debate the science to assert a couple of things that are truths, that are indisputable truths. The climate is changing, will always change. It's, there's, no, there's no set point, there's never been a set point. Mm -hmm. The question of how much humans are influencing it is, is the science debate we're having, but right. it's always changing, it's always gonna right. change. Even if the human influence is de minimis, it's gonna change in the future. It could be a lot right. hotter or a lot colder in the future, but it's gonna, it's gonna change. So that's an indisputable fact. So to deal with that indisputable fact, if some of the changes to some parts of the world are harmful, then what you want is money to do resilience and mitigation because that's what you can do. And it takes wealth, first of all, to do resilience and mitigation for whatever the effects are for your region of the planet. To your point, it depends where you are. The second indisputable point, it, and it's nothing to do with climate science, it is nothing, absolutely nothing, in the physics or the engineering economics of the world that we live in that will allow us to stop burning oil, gas, and, and coal in the next half century. Nothing, it's not possible, it's not happening. This, this, this hand-waving of an accelerating transition is embarrassing hyperbole, it, it, it isn't in the data. I mean, if we can stick on a micro basis, 20 years, $5 trillion plus in the Western world spent on avoiding oil and gas use. It's more than 5 trillion, but I'm using the official numbers. 5 trillion, 20 years. We've reduced dependency on hydrocarbons by two percentage points. 20 years ago, it was 86 percentage points. It's 84% now. So two percentage point reduction after $5 trillion over 20 years. Wow. We're, proposing, we're proposing to use more of exactly the same stuff to spend more of the money. Well, let's say double down. Okay, spend $10 trillion and, and knock off another four percentage points. Spend... 20, 30 trillion dollars, you know, the world's entire GDP, annual GDP over the next decade, which is not nothing. It's a lot of money yeah. you're not using for resilience or healthcare, right. for poverty. Right. To deliver the same product, by the way, you're delivering the exact same damn thing. And what you've got is you're still, you still have the majority of the world's energy coming from hydrocarbons. So when I say there's no transition, I don't mean this as a political statement. I don't mean this as an objection to climate science. It has nothing to do with that. It isn't happening. It's just it physics. Can't happen. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's actually arithmetic. Right. And when people say, oh, we'll right. just have to build it faster. You can't build yeah. it faster. You right. can't, you, you, there's not enough backhoes on the planet to do this and you can't build the backhoes fast enough. And then you'll, then you always hear and you probably in particular, we'll just do a moonshot program for the technology, which drives me crazy because it's a category error problem, putting 12 men on the moon once at $200 billion, which is what it costs in today's dollars. Amazing engineering achievement. I mean, inspired me, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, amazing achievement. Uh, yeah. There you go, my moon, Omega moon guy. I mean, this is, but putting, changing the society's energy systems to be facetious but accurate is like putting all of humanity on the moon permanently. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a one-time stunt. It's not a one kind of rocket. It's right. not, it, it's, it's a change in the fundamental operating system in the atoms not bits world for the planet that won't happen for i would say centuries by the way and i and be right but i'll say a, i'll say a century we, when we discover room temperature superconductors which i think will happen and make them cheaply which is the, not going to be easy when right. we make cheap nukes if let's just take about fusion we haven't talked about fusion 
I take a, I take the nukes, the fission first, but fu- fusion, they're, they're playing so much misdirection with fusion now that all these breakthroughs are, are a statistical chicanery with what's really going on. Fusion's, fusion will eventually be conquered. Uh, mm-hmm. It's an amazing piece of physics. Uh, it's probably the hardest piece of uh, engineering physics that we're, we're facing uh, and attempting to conquer. I, I would happily take the bet that there's not going to be anything that will resemble a breakthrough anytime in the near future, but assume it happens. The timeline from demonstrating a machine that works, which would be the equivalent net energy yield would, in first fission was easy. As soon as you did fission, you had net energy yield. You, right. were, you didn't right. have to guess. Right. First fission, you know, <laughs> let's say we'll, we'll date it to roughly 80 years ago. Within, within 15 years of first fission, we got commercial nuclear plants built. The first one was in England, um, you know, Calder Hall. So, but 15 years on a, on a monomaniacal program of the Atomic Energy Commission and the equivalent in Britain to do it. And then, and then to get to significant penetration of global energy markets. Now the 20 years passed and we, we got all the way up to 10%. So if tomorrow somebody does true first fusion, true net energy yield, and I won't say they're lying, but they're fingers on the scale of data so far. <laughs> <laughs> then we're, we're we're 20 years away yeah my friend the national ignition facility out at livermore yeah but they do the laser is their technique to get the yeah. temperature yeah. Well, and pressure they, yeah they were counting laser energy in versus energy out from the pellet but they didn't count the energy to make the lasers uh ch- work so well i did well they so she told me they got close they weren't break even but they were the i always thought it was like five or ten percent and they were like 60 or 70 percent i forgot the exact number they were getting but and i was like well that's exciting and she's like yeah but we're still 20 years away from well, from a commercial well, plant I, I won't dispute her um because i have to go back and check the data i checked on this i think they're a long way away from it but set, let's assume i'm she I'm said wrong. 20 years she said 20 no years. i mean in terms of the energetic uh the the net break pain, even right it, but if but she's right we're in, in 20 years not from starting to build lots of commercial nuclear plants right uh, com- commercial fusion plants it's 20 years away from having a design basis to start thinking about how to build fusion plants. That's what, you, if you ask her, does she, we're not, if you want to start building a, a, a commercial fusion industry of consequence, that'll be of consequential 10 or 20 years from now, you'd be starting today. Right. You're still trying to figure out how to make a design that's conceivable to make a commercial plant. We don't right. have that yet. Right. We're not there. So fusion, but it, Let's stick with something that we can imagine that's, that's not as hard as fusion. A material scientist figures out how to make a room temperature superconductor at low cost. Mm-hmm. That's a, there's a battery, baby. Well, I yeah, mean, but well, I, I think I'd rather work on peace in, in the Middle East first. I mean, that's, a, well, that's not an easy problem. It's easier than fusion. Really? Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. I just... I, well, I'm not a material scientist, so I don't know. Well, let's just let's assume they're both hard problems. This my point is there 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 is room for innovation. Right. Uh, magical stuff will happen and it'll seem like magic in hindsight uh, to us today. And in hindsight, right. it'll be obvious that we, we, we got this this magic uh, state of affairs. Um, but and that would change the world if that plus cheap nukes, then you're then you're 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 gonna do a lot of different things. You can with cheap nukes that make cheap electricity they run 24 7 for 30 years without refueling excuse no, me no emissions no well you got upstream you got to do stuff but but on a, on a net net basis yeah you, you know you got to mine things you got to make steel you got to make the beryllium you got to uh, you know all these things but but you're right where it's operating it's no emissions no noise no footprint yeah. no i mean this is why not what's not to love you can do steel and in, in concrete factories with carbon capture, so that mi- reduces emissions. Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, carbon capture is just a, a, another word for making the product more expensive. <laughs> I'm back to the antithetical to human progress. So at some point, the balancing act <laughs> has to be faced up to whatever you think the carbon capture costs today it is off the charts too high to do it to almost any product. In there the future, are, it'll be you, cheaper. You know? If you can use carbon, though, which you okay. can use carbon for concrete aggregate, which is the an interesting The world does not idea. have enough use for carbon at the volumes of carbon dioxide planet produces. You can't and, use it. Unless you could use it for concrete aggregate. There's a, that's a pretty high demand. Maybe it's not 100%, but so there's a lot use, of tons of concrete aggregate. 
if I'm, if I'm correct on the material sciences, it's not carbon, you're using graphene, which is a carbon product. And the graphene flakes in uh, concrete uh, are the single biggest reduction in concrete volume to get the same tensile compressive strength that you can get. Maybe a 30% reduction is a really big deal, but it's not, it's not the kind of carbon you get in carbon capture. It's a wrong form. So you, you have a whole set of uh, economics in that. But even, even in that case, if you do the arithmetic, the volume of flows here on carbon capture for the, for the civilization utterly overwhelm any use function on the other side to offset the cost. They just overwhelm it. Yeah, yeah, it's a cost. So you can also use it. For, well, by the way, my company does that. We make GNP graphene yeah. that can be used in asphalt and concrete. That's Don't one of our, it. yeah. Great, great product. One of our, one of our things. No, I mean, not, you can take calcium or, and make calcium carbonate. Yeah, and sure. And you can actually make like the rocks. Yeah, sure. Of course, they all, it's, it's I'll just cost. come back to the same yeah. thing. It all costs money. Yeah. So yeah. the entire march of human history, yeah. the entire march of human history, not without any exception, has been an attempt by society to reduce the cost of energy inputs. Right. And everything you do to increase the cost is antithetical to the progress of history. It's and, going and, uphill. And, and it's, it costs today. Not, it's not, maybe it's a cost tomorrow. You can't do life cycle stuff. It's a cost right. today. Right. It, it affirmatively harms other human beings on our planet. And that calculus has to be faced up. We can, we can make the decision that we're going to increase the cost of energy. Because if we increase the cost of our energy, it increases global energy costs because that's how systems work in a real economy. You can't regulate costs in the world. Price controls don't work. They cause inflation. So if we don't face up to that fact, we're being dishonest with ourselves. If we politically say, it's okay, I recognize the harm it's causing to poor people, but I want to do it anyway. But to pretend there isn't a harm, which is what a lot of policymakers are doing, to pretend it's just a free lunch. But there's a harm from emissions too. Not, well, I, I dispute you on this. There's no harm from carbon dioxide emissions today. The idea that we're having events today that are the kind that we're trying to avoid in the future is it, it, we don't have to go down the, the science rat hole. The, the meteorological data on uh, what's going on in the world today, today's planet. You right. cannot make the case. There's massive harm to the world's economies from, from, from the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. All hmm. of the harm functions are pushed into the future. And there are theoretical harm functions by virtue of the fact that they're in the future. They are, these are future harms, not today's right. harms. The claim that we have more droughts, more this, more all this extreme weather stuff is a, and I'll be unkind on this. This is a made up uh, alarmism by the environmental lobby. They're trying to get people excited about harms today because they don't accept for reasons that are obvious, spending a lot of money today to avoid a harm a long way in the future that's, that's, that's a calculated harm. So, you, so you're not one of the co-authors of the IPCC then, I take it. Well, I would, I would tell you that <laughs> I'm not a co-author of the IPCC executive right. summaries, the body of the IPCC. So I'm, I'm getting off of my expertise turf and echoing um, what I, I know for people I trust who read the IPCC documents. Right. Right. The IPCC documents and the scientists in the IPCC, as my good friend Dick Lindzen would point out, are good scientists have done excellent work. And what they are saying is not what's in the executive summary that is being referred to. Hmm. The, the alarmism uh, that we have to, that the, change is accelerating the, all that language in the new executive summary does not appear. And you, again, this, the problem with debate is if I say, go to Dr. Google and find people who are actually reading the summary and comparing the executive summary to the body of the report, right. they say, oh, of course they'll say it. They're, they're climate deniers, they're not climate deniers. They're scientists who say that the executive summary says this, the body of the report says this, they are, they're incommensurate. So we have incommensurate claims being made by the scientists themselves in the public policy arm of the IPCC. Huh. I need to go read it. They just, the inter, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for those who don't know, it's kind of the gold standard of climate, a bunch sure. of different countries That's contribute science. to it. So I need to, I need, I, I've read them in the past. I need to read the one. It just came out. There was just a new report that came out. I know, out. but the executive summaries are not what you want to read. Right. And you, you know, these, these dig, are, in, dig in the data. They're, they're written by policy advocates and policymakers. This is, true in all uh, government agencies, that's a government agency. Uh, they, they, in some cases, what they're reflecting may be accurate, in others it's not. But let me, let me just say again, even where their executive summary is making claims that it's quote accelerating and it's gonna be more severe than we thought, 
in the future. Right. They're not, they're not saying that we looked at the data and in fact, the whole planet is burning. The claims of excess wildfires are statistically. People say that. I know people, they say people that. make the claim. Yeah. People made a lot of claims about but, nuclear. I've been around people making claims that are, that are not true for a long time. Right. But, so you could. But the number again, of hurricanes has gone up. I don't no, know. It's not, it's not you true. don't think it has? Okay. No, it hasn't. So go, you, you, you can go back to your fellow agency, not, not NASA, but NOAA. The right. NOAA data on hurricane frequency, this is why, let's do, let's do hurricanes because they're easiest. Yeah. We've been tracking hurricanes for a century and a half in, in yeah. the United States. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of hurricanes here, unlike other, other continents. Uh, we just track them. So the, 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 the frequency and severity data are well known and the data are published. They're un, unmodified NOAA data. And the, what's gone up are the uh, economic harms from hurricanes, which is a measure of wealth and construction of more, right. uh, more, more property on coastlines. Beachfront, yeah. Right. But, it's, but the physical frequency and their intensity over the century is not rising. It's just not. Mm-hmm. And the wildfires in California, which are horrific, which are being labeled as climate change wildfires, yes, it is from the climate. That's the climate, broadly speaking, the warm and the, the temperature and weather. But the frequency of wildfires globally, we're talking about the planet, not Northern California. This is a planet. So yeah. these allegations about the planet require data, which, as you know, NASA satellites has collected on global uh, grassland and forest fires for a long time, for about 60 years. Those data do not show a trend line of global fires going up. They show the short-term trends up, short-term trends now with the net, net, net is not really much of a signal of any kind. Now, if there's a signal, it's de minimis, and this is not a hair on fire, no pun intended. <laughs> well, the Arctic has gotten a lot warmer. And what companies else? are, the Arctic has, yeah, the ice is melting. The ice is a lot smaller than it used to be. In fact, the global shipping global shipping companies yeah, have I, put their money where their mouth is, right? We, they're built, they're building to, boats to go over the North Pole. So again, we're, we have to we're talking about the planet again. Yeah. Uh, so without yes, the Greenland's glaciers I gather have lost mass, no question. Uh, based on my reading, Antarctic mass has gained ice. By the way, so that again, stopped. I, that was true. The newest report says that tr- that trend is has turned okay, the corner. But so. Yeah. Uh, Let's just take that on face value, since you're a, you're a math guy. That I would mean math major. I was a math minor. I was a, I was a dual major, and then I discovered math was hard, so I dropped <laughs> it to a minor. <laughs> Took physics as a major. So what you just described was not an accelerating trend. It the, the ice accumulation during the period of CO two accumulation, we had we had net ice accumulation. The, the point I'm going to go back to the point I was making that. That's, that's a future harm. So now we're talking about uh, the conviction that the slowing down on the ice accumulation in the Antarctic is a result of the CO2 concentration. Okay, fair enough. We're still talking about a forecast in the future, not a today's harm. I keep coming back to this point. Mm-hmm. Is the money we're spending today to combat a future harm, not today's harms? And the, and the, the argument has been a bait and switch to try to convince everybody that we have existential today harms, which is not the case. We have severe problems at all kinds of the planet where people are affected by tsunamis and fires mm. and droughts and, you know, and floods. invasion by dictators. And, yeah, Going well, dictators back to my tend, first thesis. Yeah. Hu- hu- human beings have done a much better job of killing other humans. Yeah. On average in nature. The only thing that does a better job is, is the alien that lives among us, which are viruses and bacteria. And right. the worst is not the virus. Over t- all human history, including today, if you look at data, the single biggest killer of humanity are bacteria hmm. from infections. They're, they're, uh, but uh, you look know, here, I want to come back to the climate stuff because it doesn't matter. My, my point is I generally don't talk about climate. So you've successfully, because I respect you so much, <laughs> drag me down a rat hole going down with climate. Cause people say, well, Mills doesn't know what he's talking about. Cause he doesn't believe in the climate science it, <laughs> and the stuff that I want to argue about the stuff that I care about and when we come to these debates, is the answer to the question, let's, I'll give you, it's true, I'll just give you that. Let's just say we're having an outsized effect on the, on the world's climate. And then the question you'd have to have is, what are we going to do about it? And the answer right. is not right. wind, solar, and batteries. They're gonna, in fact, it's not only not, because it's profoundly economically destructive, I can-, I can Environmentally destructive. They're environmentally destructive. And more importantly, that 
the probable result of increasing EVs by mandate will lead to increased CO2 emissions because of where the minerals are coming from and how they have to be mined in decreasing ore grades. And, and the IEA, another respected body like the IPCC, yeah. it buried in like page 200 of a 300 page report on energy minerals, points out that the net emissions increases from the marginal pound of copper right. are rising. Are more, yeah. Mark, I gotta, we, I, unfortunately I have to cut it off now, but we need to continue this. There's so many to good things to talk I, about. I, make, I embarrass myself by talking about climate science. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and we, we need to continue this. This is fascinating. And again, if you love the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating. But thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Great, great to be on. I want you to get me a ride in F-16. But <laughs> that's, 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 the, 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 uh, that's the penance you have to pay for putting up with me. Or a space shuttle. That'd be good too. I, I take that in a heartbeat, baby. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Thanks.